Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to this Utah State University pre-dawn lecture series, <laughs> otherwise referred to as the Sunrise Sessions. My name is Larry Smith, and I am serving as the Interim Vice President for Research for the next little while. And it's my pleasure to host this event this morning. It's my second sunrise session. My first one was uh, during the first week of August when we had Abby Benninghoff speak uh, to the group. Usually, President Cockett uh, of Utah State attends these events, but uh, she's unable to join us this morning and, and regrets so. Uh, this is one of her favorite uh, events. She, she not only enjoys listening uh, uh, to uh, Utah State faculty talk about their cool science, but it also gives her a chance to connect with you and meet and chat with many of you. Uh, Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield is the very generous sponsor of the Sunrise Sessions, and I want to express my sincerest thanks to Utah Regents President Jim Swayze uh, for this very special partnership between this great company and Utah State. And I'd also like to uh, thank Eric Hales from Regents uh, for joining us this morning. So thank you, Eric. These sessions are a uh, success because of you. And we're grateful for your attendance uh, despite the early hour. Uh, I'd like to recognize a couple of folks uh, who are here. Uh, Representative uh, Timothy Hawks from District 18 in Centerville. Thank you for joining us this morning. And also uh, Randy Stockham, who is a member of the Yoshu uh, Board of uh, Foundation Board. Thank you. Sunrise sessions are just one of the ways that USU is able to share some of the outstanding research being done by impressive USU faculty. And today, we will hear from another of our star faculty. We have with us Dr. Joe Wilson, Associate Professor in Utah State University's Department of Biology and Joe is actually located at our regional campus in Tooele, just on the other side of the Ochre Mountains. Uh, Joe is a native of Utah and has always had a love of biology. In fact, we're told that at two years old, he told his parents that when he grew up, he was going to be a lion. <laughs> How's that working out for you, Joe? So. But while he hasn't become a lion biologically, he has become a king of the forest metaphorically. Right? Yeah, attaboy, Joe. Uh, Joe uh, <clears throat> uh, kind of wandered uh, through the USU higher education system, I'm told, uh, but eventually got both his bachelor's degree and doctorate degree from Utah State University. Uh, Joe's area of research, oh, he joined the faculty at Utah State University in 2012. Uh, and Joe's area of research is on the evolution and ecology of bees and wasps, insects that are enormously important uh, in economic terms and agriculturally uh, throughout the world. And uh, uh, there are some very serious issues uh, regarding uh, bee populations now uh, on the planet. He has received many honors for his research, and he tells a fascinating story that I know that all of you will enjoy very much. So without further ado, let's welcome uh, Dr. Wilson. Thank you very much. All right, I'm excited to be here, partly because I get to talk about bees, but also because I get to talk about bees in Utah, my home state. So we're gonna start this recording and then, then we'll get going. Okay, and when it starts, I'll tell you about bees. So bee diversity in the beehive state, we live in the beehive state. Utah has a lot of things to celebrate, a lot of interesting uh, geological diversity and cultural diversity, and we have bee diversity. So you might know that in the beehive state, our state insect is the honeybee. It's kind of interesting because honeybees aren't even from Utah. 
They're actually from Europe. They're not even from the United States. But the honeybee and the symbology around the honeybee surround us in the beehive state. It's on our state seal. It's on our state highway patrol cars. Uh, it's on our state flag. It's at the state capitol. And so the early settlers of Utah liked this metaphor of the, the beehive and honeybees in particular for a couple of reasons. They're hard workers, they work together, they show industry and thrift. And so they, they liked this metaphor because it, they saw bees in themselves. They wanted to emulate these characteristics. And that's a good metaphor. I see the metaphor of the beehive state slightly differently. To me, a beehive is an area where lots of bees live. And Utah truly is a beehive state. We have lots of kinds of bees that live here. And so just so you know, when you're looking at this picture, these are all scaled to each other. This is a honeybee right here, and we have lots of other kinds of bees. Some are big and some are small. Uh, we have a lot of kinds of bees in Utah. And so in fact, everything east of the Mississippi River in North America, there's about 750 bee species. So it's a lot of different kinds of bees. But Utah, Utah alone, has over 1,100. So we have nearly one and a half as many kinds of bees in Utah than everything east of the Mississippi River. That represents about 25% of the bee diversity in North America. So one in every four bee species known from the US can be found in Utah. So we really are a beehive state. But so when I talk about bees, people think of various different things. And maybe you're thinking, okay, I have honeybees and bumblebees and yellow jackets and hornets, but I'm not talking about all of those. So in this picture, one of these bugs is a bee. The other, one are wa other ones are wasps and flies. So there's the bee right there. So we need to take some time this morning to talk about the differences between bees and wasps and bees and flies. So here we have a bee and a fly. Which one is the fly? The one on the left, that is a fly. How do you tell the difference? Well, there's a couple ways that you can actually pretty easily distinguish flies from bees. So bees have pollen-collecting hairs. You can see on the back leg of that bee, it has these big hairs to collect pollen. The fly's back legs are skinny, so that's one good indication that it's a fly. Um, my kids often look at the, the heads of bees and flies, and they can tell the difference. So flies have these short, stubby antennas, and bees have longer antennas. Also, the fly's eyes fill most of its head. You can see that eye is like half of its head. The bee's eyes are what I consider regular-sized eyes. Um, also, people always want to tell me flies have two wings and bees have four wings. And biologically, that's true, but you can't really count the wings on a bee or on a fly when it's flying or when it's crawling around a flower. So I usually don't use the wings. But if you look at their heads, you can tell the difference between a bee and a fly pretty easily. But what about bees and wasps? It's a little bit trickier. What are some, some characteristics you guys think of when you think of wasps? Someone said mean. I think of that too. Anything else? They can sting multiple times. So associated with this meanness, right? So there's some, there some physical characteristics that sometimes work. For example, a lot of wasps have skinny little waists. This one has an extremely long skinny waist. But wasps, we think of as the little skinny wasp waist. Also, wasps usually have skinny legs. They don't have the big pollen collecting hairs. That can be a good indication. Uh, they're also usually not very hairy in general. So people can sometimes tell the difference between bees and wasps. But there's some problems with these physical characteristics. They don't always hold true. So we still have this bee down here in the corner. The problem is these other waspy looking bugs, those are also bees. So it's pretty hard to tell the difference between a wasp and a bee physically, but there are some good behavioral differences um, that we can use to distinguish between these bugs. So bees and wasps have different dietary preferences. They, they follow different diets. Bees are um, pollen eaters and wasps are meat eaters, including bugs. This is a wasp eating part of a katydid. Um, so you could say that bees are vegetarians and wasps maybe follow the keto diet, if you're familiar with that one. So when I'm talking about bees in the beehive state, I'm talking about these bees, the pollen-eating bees. I'm not talking about the yellow jackets and the hornets and the other things. So I did some research recently. To, to I wanted to know what people know about bees, especially these native bees, the, other, the bees besides honeybees. And I asked them a variety of questions. Most people agreed that bees were important. Then I showed them this picture and said, which ones of these are bees? And I want to do this, this part of the survey with you guys to see how you do. So the way we'll do this is I'm going to point to number one. And if you think it's a bee, you call out yes. If you think it's not a bee, you call out no. So I don't care if you know what it is, but it's a yes or no kind of question. So we'll start. Number one, yes or no? Yes. Number two? Yes. Number three? No. Number four? Yes. Number five? No. Good, that's a grasshopper, guys. Um, <laughs> Number six? Yes. Number seven? Yes. Number eight? Yes. 
Number nine? Yes. And number ten? Yes. Okay, so this is what always happens when I do this. People start off really strong, right? There's a fly, and they say no, and there's a bumblebee, and they say yes. You get down around here, and people start, they don't say anything. There was like, on one of these, I heard one person over here say, I don't know if they said no or yes. So how do you think you did? Are you ready? These are the bees. So some are pretty easily recognized as bees. There's the honeybee again. And other ones, like this blue and green bee, people don't recognize them as bees. It's kind of interesting to me because both this blue bee and this green bee, they're pretty common, especially here in Utah. So when I did this survey across the country, people did had similar results to you guys. Most people knew bumblebees and honeybees. The majority of people did not recognize the green or the blue bee as a bee. Um, even though they're, these can be found across the country and they're fairly common. So it's kind of interesting. We, we know bees are important, but we're missing this idea that there's other bees besides the orange and yellow bees out there. And maybe this is because we, when we think of bees, we think of bees like we see on the Cheerio, Cheerio boxes, Honey Nut Cheerios. Uh, those are honeybees. And so most people think of honeybees as the bee, the quintessential bee. And they think about the facts that are associated with honeybees. They sting you once and they die, for example. They live in big hives with thousands of workers. Um, there's a queen and they make honey. They make honeycomb and they pollinate lots of flowers. Those are all good facts about honeybees. But what people don't recognize is that the honeybee is actually the black sheep of the bee world. That's a, a black sheep, you get it? <laughs> so black sheep meaning that honeybees aren't like other bees. So all these facts we think about with bees they don't really, they're not true for most of the other bees. In fact, most bees in the United States, and especially here in Utah, most bees nest in the ground. They're solitary ground nesting bees. So solitary, they live by themselves and they nest in a hole in the ground. Here's a bee coming out of her ground nest. And so the entrance to these nests have different structures and different architecture. Sometimes it's just a hole in the ground. Sometimes there's a pile of dirt around it like, a, like an anthill. Some bees even build these little chimneys around the entrance to their nest. But regardless, these ground nesting bees will bring pollen and nectar down into that hole. Uh, they make little rooms at the bottom and they fill those rooms with pollen and nectar and lay an egg in there. That's their nest. There's no hive, there's no queen, there's no honey involved. But not all bees nest in the, in the ground. There's other bees that will nest in, ho in holes and pieces of wood. Uh, this is a leaf cutter bee. She's carrying a piece of leaf to, to line the edges of that hole, kind of like wallpaper. Other leafcutter bees might find a, a crack in a piece of wood, and they'll use that leaf to construct their nests. So they use their saliva and these cut pieces of leaves to make little rooms. Here's a series of little rooms in this hole. Um, each one of those rooms is a little nest cell, kind of like a nursery. She puts pollen and nectar in there and lays an egg in it. In the spring, that, that new bee will chew its way out and start the process all over. So it's a solitary bee, no hive, no honey involved. Um, but still, it's one of these bees that's native to Utah that makes up the beehive state. So you might be thinking to yourself, what makes Utah so diverse for bees? Why do we have so many kinds of bees here? And it's probably because where Utah sits geographically. So some of my research is looking at bee diversity across ecoregions in North America. So an ecoregion is like a distinct habitat type. So App the Appalachians ecoregion, for example, it's a, a broad habitat that has some, some uniformity across it. So we've been mapping bee species onto ecoregions, and you can see the areas with the highest bee diversity, the most species, are the deserts of the western, of western, the western United States, with the highest being the Great Basin here, Colorado Plateau here, and the Mojave Desert there. So that if we zoom in and look where Utah sits, in western Utah, we have the Great Basin Desert, Southeastern Utah, we have the Colorado Plateau. And then down in St. George, we have the, the very northernmost part of the Mojave Desert. So we sit in, the, in an area that has three of the most diverse ecoregions for bees. So this makes Utah probably one of the, the states with the highest bee diversity. We probably have more kinds of bees than most other states, but the research hasn't really been done for most states. And so across Utah, bee diversity isn't equal, though. For example, I did a study of bees on sand dunes and dugway proving grounds out in the West Desert. And I found 250 bee species, which, which isn't bad. That's a lot of kind of bees to live on sand dunes out there. But I also participated in a study in the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Um, we found, oops, 660 different bee species. 
So a lot of bees down in the grand staircase. And this study was led by my colleague, Olivia Carroll, when she was a graduate student at Utah State University. So she spent four years down there collecting bees, and that's, we're just now publishing the data. Um, 660 species is a lot of bees from the Grand Staircase. And so let's take a look at this, this area. Grand Staircase National Monument was originally established in 1996, and it was established for a variety of reasons. Uh, rich paleontological diversity, lots of fossils and dinosaur bones and dinosaur tracks down there. Uh, a lot of cultural uh, diversity, a lot of Native American artifacts and sites. Um, most people think of the Grand Staircase National Monument as an area for tourism. There's a lot of really cool places there, slot canyons. Here's me and my family in a slot canyon down in the Grand Staircase. Uh, other cool landscapes, people love to ride their motorcycles along Highway 12 because, well, first the road is cool, but also you see this really kind of unearthly landscape with these sandstone uh, buttes and other really interesting geological features. But the Grand Staircase wasn't established just to be a tourism destination. In fact, part of the original proclamation states that it's, it's set aside to protect some of the biological diversity in that area. For example, this Grand, Sta Grand Staircase National Monument has 84% of all of Utah's flowering plant species. So 84% of the plants known from Utah can be found just in this small area down there. So it truly is a, a hot spot of floral diversity. And in that original proclamation in 1996, the area was set aside to protect those plants, but also the pollinators that help support those plants. And so these plant communities, oh, this is telling me that something's not working. Let me just push cancel for a second, there we go. I'll push that button. So these flowers, um, these flowers are super diverse in the Grand Staircase. 84% of Utah's flowers are there. But we hadn't really looked at what bees are there, even though this was set aside to help protect those bees. And so if we take a look at this, an area the size of roughly Delaware, the Grand Staircase National Monument, has nearly as many bee species as the entire eastern US. So in this beehive state, the hot spot of bee diversity seems to be in southern Utah around the Grand Staircase National Monument. And so let's look more closely at those 660 bee species that we have. Among those 660 species, we found 49 new undescribed species, so species, bee species that scientists didn't know existed until our study in the Grand Staircase. Also, we had 150 what we're calling morpho species. So a morpho species is a bee species that is, looks unique. It's not unique enough to say, yes, this is a new species, but it's something that doesn't look like the, the known species that we're familiar with. So these 150 species are of scientific interest because we're not sure exactly what they are. So that's nearly 200 species that, that we're unsure about. More research needs to be done on these bees. But let me take some time to introduce you to some of the bees from the Grand Staircase and Utah at, at large so we can be more familiar with some of the diversity here. So we have mining bees. There are 71 species of mining bee in the Grand Staircase. Three of them were new undescribed species. Mining bees are pretty diverse bees, lots of different shapes and colors and sizes but they all come out in the early spring. These are some of the first bees to emerge in the spring. In St. George, I've seen them as early as February. And so mining bees get their names because they, they are ground nesting bees. They mine to make their nest. They're all solitary bees, and many mining bees have floral preferences. They're specialists on certain kinds of flowers. For example, one species in the Grand Staircase, it only visits willow flowers in the early spring. That's the only flower it will, it will collect pollen from. We have a relative of the mining bee called the fairy bee. This is my favorite kind of bee. Uh, fairy bees are really small, and people often just, it, it, they don't even notice them in a landscape. They're buzzing around a little bush, but we think of them as, we see them as little gnats or something maybe. We had 87 species in the Grand Staircase. 16 of them are new undescribed species. And they're my favorite species, uh, my, my favorite bees, because they're some of the smallest bees in North America. You can see that that little fairy bee is just longer than George Washington's nose on the quarter. So they're just really cool bees and really diverse in the Grand Staircase National Monument. We also have digger bees, as their name indicates, they dig. They are also a solitary ground nesting bee. We had 22 species, with three of them being new undescribed species. Um, they'll use their mandibles and their front legs to dig a hole in the ground. But there's this unique bee we found down in the Grand Staircase that was just described not too long ago, a couple of years ago. This is Anthophora, Anthophora Pueblo, kind of a... Uh, complicated sounding name, but it gets its name because it's, it's changed evolutionary, changed its habit from digging in the ground to it actually excavates its nest in sandstone cliffs. So this is a picture of a female um, Pueblo bee 
coming out of its nest. So that's a piece of sandstone there. Pretty cool bee that was originally found from the Grand Staircase and now is known from some surrounding areas. We also had bumblebees down there, and while they're not particularly diverse down in the desert, bumblebees are more common up in the mountains and in alpine areas, we had six species of bumblebee, but one of these is particularly interesting. This one down here is the western bumblebee. It used to be one of the most common bees along the Pacific Northwest, the West Coast. In recent decades, it has experienced dramatic um, population declines, but we found a, a pretty stable population in the Grand Staircase. If you've ever hiked Calf Creek Falls down in the Grand Staircase National Monument, uh, there's a population of Bombus occidentalis, this western bumblebee, found in that part of the monument. We also have polyester bees. I brought this one up because the name is so strange, a polyester bee. Uh, polyester bees, we had 22 species, with three of them being new species, but they get their name because they have this interesting ability to secrete this plastic-like substance from their abdomen. They use it to line their underground nest. So it's kind of like, it looks a lot like cellophane, like the stuff you'd put over your leftovers, uh, plastic wrap. So they line their nest with that, and then instead of filling it with mostly pollen for their babies, they mostly fill it with nectar with a little bit of pollen mixed in, like a pollen soup. And they lay an egg that floats on top of that soup, and that's what their baby eats. So there's the cellophane bee with, with her nest, her plastic polyester-like nest. Um, one of their close relatives are the white-faced bees. White-faced bees have white faces. They look a lot like wasps because notice they're not very hairy. They actually are one of the only bees that doesn't have pollen-collecting hairs. They don't have a way to carry pollen. So instead, what these white-faced bees do is they eat the pollen. They ingest it and store it in their stomach, fly back to their nest, and regurgitate it like a bird would do. So they're kind of unique among bees, but they look a lot like wasps. They're pretty small, and people often assume it's a wasp on their flower. We had 12 species, with three of them being new species in the Grand Staircase. So the last one I bring up are the mason bees. These are some of my other favorites because they're colors. They're metallic blue and green. Sometimes they're even metallic purple. We had 44 species. Two of them are new species. Um, mason bees get their names because they collect mud. So here's a picture of a mason bee gathering mud from the side of a stream. They bring that mud back and construct a nest out of it like a, a brick mason would do. Sometimes they even use little pebbles to stick in the mud uh, like a little brick wall. So mason bees are also a very cool bee from down in the Grand Staircase, found across Utah. When I talk to people about these bees, all these other kinds of bees, they say, well, that's interesting, but do they pollinate? And that's a great question. The answer is yes, they do pollinate. And in some cases, they're really excellent pollinators. For example, this mason bee, this is sitting on a, an apple blossom. Uh, mason bees are important pollinators for Utah's orchards. Some studies have shown that the pollination that 100 honeybees can do in an orchard can be done by only two mason bees. So yes, they're pollinators, and in some cases, they're really excellent pollinators. Now, this high efficiency of these pollination of these wild bees can be attributed to lots of different things. Uh, their behaviors, like for example, mason bees carry the pollen on their belly, so they approach the flower differently than a honeybee would. But it's also partly because a lot of these wild bees have food preferences. They're picky eaters, like I, I talked about the, the mining bees before. This is a squash bee. As her name indicates, she pollinates squash flowers. So that's pumpkins and that's zucchinis and other, other flowers like that. She'll only visit squash flowers. So because of this, this preference and this specialization she has on squash flowers, she has become a very excellent pollinator of squash flowers. So next month when you eat your pumpkin pie, think of the squash bee because probably she had a role in the, in the pollination of that pumpkin. Also, some of these wild native bees have other abilities that honeybees just don't possess. For example, buzz pollination. Uh, some flowers don't release their pollen very easily. This is a tomato flower, and for some reason, tomato flowers hold on to their pollen. They just don't let it go. So honeybees ignore your tomato flowers, largely. But a lot of these native bees have this special ability to unhook their wings from their wing muscles, and they can vibrate at a certain frequency, causing the pollen to fall out of those flowers. So tomatoes, tomatillos, eggplants, even blueberries, they produce a lot more fruit when they're buzz pollinated. So these wild bees can buzz pollinate, honeybees just don't know how to do it. So hopefully you feel a little bit more enlightened about some of these bees in Utah. There's a lot of kinds of bees in our beehive state, and this hot spot of bee diversity is kind of a unique area down there. But you might be thinking to yourself, okay, the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, I probably should have said, formerly known as the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, because earlier this year, President Trump reduced the size of that national monument by about 50% and established three new management units, the Escalante Canyons Unit, Kaparowitz Unit, and the Grand Staircase Unit. 
So you might be wondering, as I was wondering, well, what does that mean for the bees that live in this hot spot of bee diversity? Well, I looked it up and I did some research and I found that there's 84 species that we originally collected from the Grand Staircase that are now not found in the protected land. So they're only known from these yellow areas, which now don't fall into these monument protections. And so who are these 84 species? Well, I mapped some of the interesting ones onto this map here. We have bees that are endemic to the Colorado Plateau in white, the white dots. So they're only known from the Colorado Plateau ecoregion. We have other bees that we collected that are primarily known from the hot desert. So in red, these bees prior to our study were known from the Mojave Desert or the Sonoran Desert down in Southern California or down in Arizona. So this represents the northernmost populations for many of these species. We also have undescribed species and morpho species in blue and in uh, yellowish orange. And so I want to, they're scattered around these, these now excluded lands, but I want to focus your attention right around here. There's this high concentration of these unique bees. Uh, this is the Hole in the Rock Road area. It's no longer in National Monument lands. It's a big dirt road that goes across the, mon the monument here. It's also how you access a lot of those slot canyons. So it's a fairly busy dirt road, but accesses a lot of interesting areas and houses a lot of interesting bees. But not only interesting bees, uh, these are all the areas we collected in our initial study. The bigger the red circle is, the more kinds of bees we found at each of those sites. And you can see this hole in the rock road region had a lot of sites with a lot of kinds of bees. It's a pretty diverse area that is now excluded from monument protections. So that hole in the rock road region is, is, has unique bees, has a lot of kinds of bees. But even if we look specifically at one kind of bee, there's some interesting stories to tell. This is a cactus bee. As you might guess, cactus bees pollinate cactus flowers. She only visits cactus flowers. And she also has other interesting preferences. Cactus bees like to nest in hard-packed clay soil. So you'll find them on trails or find them on, the, on dirt roads and things. We found uh, along the Hole in the Rock Road this big aggregation of cactus bees nesting. So cactus bees are solitary bees. They each dig their own nest. A lot of cactus bees build these little turrets or chimneys over their nest entrance. But they, they often nest in these big aggregations, maybe hundreds or thousands of bees in a small area. Along the Hole in the Rock Road, we found a nest aggregation that probably had tens of thousands of bees in it. It went all the way across the road and went for at least 50 yards. And we went back year after year, and this nesting aggregation persisted for at least 10 years. So it's this kind of long-term nesting site for these solitary ground-nesting bees. So what's going to happen to these bees now that the Hole in the Rock Road is no longer in, in the National Monument? It's no longer protected by those National Monument protections. Well, the answer is we don't know. It depends on what Utah does with that road. If we decide to pave it, that will not be good for these cactus bees, right? In the next year, they can't dig out from a paved road. And so hopefully today, I've, I've introduced you to some of these bees and made you think a little bit. The Grand Staircase National Monument, yes, it does have some scenic beauty. Yes, it does have some tourism value, but that's not all. When it was originally established, it was set up to be a natural laboratory to study plants and pollinators and other biological diversity that we find down there. And so through our study, we have been able to show that yes, it is a hot spot of bee diversity, but now that this natural laboratory is changing, it, it impedes our ability to continue studying this bee diversity. It at least changes our ability to study this bee diversity. So hopefully I've piqued your interest. Uh, if I have, there's various social media platforms that I, I share stuff about bees, so feel free to take a picture of that or write it down or whatever, and I would love to take questions if you have any.